this Lee Day event uh, where we'll be talking you through the solicitor apprenticeship uh, 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 scheme that we have at the firm. Uh, as you may know, this is a scheme that uh, is opening shortly for applications. And over the next few weeks, we'll consider those ap applications. And we hope to be able to uh, appoint people in uh, September for a start in January 2021. Um, by way of introduction, my name is Jean Matthews. I'm one of the partners at Lee Day. I work in the human rights department. Um, I'm going to be acting as chairman for uh, this evening's webinar. I'm very um, uh, pleased uh, to say that uh, this evening we have a great panel of Lee Day uh, people, um, starting off first with uh, Fran Swain, who is the managing partner of Lee Day and has been instrumental in establishing the Solicitor Apprenticeship Scheme. Um, we're also um, very pleased to uh, say that we've got Dave Nita, who is a consultant at the firm. Uh, Dave uh, uh, trained as a lawyer and uh, more recently uh, has been using his skills to assist a number of different NGOs uh, and also uh, uh, community groups. Uh, so very pleased to have Dave with us this evening. And then I think perhaps two individuals who you'll be most interested in speaking to are two of our solicitor apprentices who joined the firm in uh, 2020. And of course, we'll be able to tell you what is it actually like to be a solicitor apprentice at Lee Day. So I'm very pleased to introduce Josephine, who is currently working in our clinical negligence team, and also Alika. Alika is, is currently working in the regulatory and uh, disciplinary team at Lee Day. So, um, I've introduced the panel members uh, and what I wanted to then move on to is uh, the individual introductions. Um, I think Alika is going to start us off. Um, so Alika, over to you. Alika, just uh, you need to unmute your uh, uh, speaker. <laughs> Hello. I'm sure you guys can hear me. Hello. Hi. Um, so, oh, fabulous. Yeah. My name is Alika and obviously as Jean said, I am working in the regulatory and disciplinary department. I started my apprenticeship in January, 2020. Um, and shall I, shall I go into the, the, the entire uh, intro or is this just the preliminary intro? Please, uh, as you wish, Alika. The whole, okay. Um, so I, before I came to Lee Day, I started um, university. Actually, um, I took a two year gap year after I finished my A-levels. And then um, I done some legal work here and there and just decided to, I was applying in the time um, I had my gap years and then I decided to go uni and then I got an apprenticeship so I chose to stop going to university and um, uh, obviously applied for the position at Lee Day and here I am. Um, so I think that obviously that's just my experience, there's a lot of different um, backgrounds to the apprentices that are at Lee Day currently so there are some people just came out of A-levels um, some people don't have any previous legal experience so obviously it's not a requirement for you to have worked in a law firm like straight out of a levels no one is expecting that um so yeah everyone is uh everyone is between when we first started the apprenticeship between well over 18 um and essentially i wanted to briefly touch on um, I guess the idea of, uh, of applying, applying in lockdown, for example. So, um, obviously I think it's, you should treat it as like a normal everyday type of interview. Um, obviously it's, it's difficult because of the whole COVID situation. Everyone is at home. You can see my lovely library collection behind me. Um, and I 
think it's still important that when you come to any interview, you know, you should dress appropriately. So important. Make sure your Wi-Fi connection is good. Make sure everyone can hear you loud and clear. And also smile because people definitely notice <laughs> when you're, uh, I guess, not as not yourself. Um, I think authenticity is, is so important when it comes to, to, to having an interview. Um, you know, and then just like generic things such as making sure the area around you is quiet, you have good lighting, etc. And it might seem like this is just normal, normal stuff that everyone should know. But <laughs> um, I think it's still really important just to keep these things in, in the back of your mind, whether you have an interview here or elsewhere, um, definitely, definitely um, make sure that you, you think of those things when you do have these interviews during lockdown. Um, so the next part that I wanted to go into, I won't go into too much depth. I'm sure that someone else will also cover it in more detail, was just like a brief overview of the application process that I went through. Um, so I wanted to know, especially at Lee Day, um, the application process is a lot less strenuous um, and is a lot more open to like who you are as an entire character as opposed to a name with some grades and like a personal statement. Um, so the, the application process that we went through was essentially, obviously there was an application that you had to fill out, like that's the first, the first hurdle. Um, and then from there, we were called into a, an interview. Um, and on that day, there were different aspects of it. Um, so there were some reasoning tests that we done, which I will not go into. Um, but definitely, definitely um, would say that it was it was a, it was a good interview process. <laughs> um, and they also then obviously took us into a an interview with actual people. Um, we also had a the tests. Sorry, were. Um, just touching on different aspects, I guess, of what you'll be doing anyway. So, uh, writing, basic numeracy skills, etc. Um, so yeah, and then I wanted to touch on the academic side. Uh, so essentially what we do is each week we would have, or generally each week, we would have an essay that is related to the tasks that were set for that week. So essentially what happens is the university will give you um, a, uh, they'll give you a topic to study. So it might be um, judicial review, for example, and then they'll give you some videos to watch, which kind of replace lectures, but they're not as long and as wordy. They're very much like straight to the point. And then you'll have um, the activities as well to, to help consolidate your learning. I also almost forgot to mention that you will have reading to do as well. Um, so the reading, it increases, changes in complexity as the course goes on. I can definitely tell you uh, <laughs> that you'll be learning um, a lot. You'll be able to tell when the course is changing, etc. And then um, obviously that happens every week where you will have an essay at the end of all of that and just write everything up um, according to the question. It might be a problem question. It might be um, just considering different parts of judicial review, for example, which I think is great because like, you're not forced to be doing 10 different topics at one time. Um, you're focusing on just public law, for example, and then obviously you will have an assessment based on that, which may be coursework or through an exam. Um, and then the skills part of it, because this is not just a law degree, it's a law, I wrote this down so I won't forget, um, a law, in, a law uh, in legal practice skills. So the skills part of it that um, we have gone through so far has been, um, essentially we would have uh, tasks, I think it's like every three months or so, but it varies depending on summer school, etc. Um, and they would basically teach you, um, the university would basically help you learn about like negotiation skills and ethics and um, time management and like the, the, the stuff that you would learn maybe if you were doing the LPC. So um, 
yes that's it and we recently just had some summer school as well which it was interesting i'll be honest i quite i quite enjoyed the reading part because i just like to read but um yeah i'm sure josephine will um talk about her experience in that as well and the last part uh was the i think it's important to note like just talking about what it's like to be a black person in law um i think that having worked in other firms before having had experience with other firms before just the law sector in general i will definitely say that it has been a uh, eye-opening process to hear about other people's experience as well um but i think that just by having this position alone it helps contribute to the narrative that like black solicitors and lawyers actually do exist and um, by being in this position you're then able to change the the narrative of the conversation by being in this position you're then able to help move in a direction that is more progressive and open um to create an environment cultivated for black lawyers and solicitors um and I think that, yeah, this is like a phenomenal opportunity to grow and learn and become uh, in, in law. So um, that's all I will touch on for now. And I will pass over to my apprentice, Josephine. Many thanks, Alika. Uh, over to you, Josephine. Thank you. Um, I'll try not to repeat anything that Alika said. Um, so my name is Josephine. Um, I'm a solicitor apprentice in the clinical negligence department and um, 23 years old. I think it's worth mentioning that, you know, the, the uh, apprenticeship scheme isn't just for um, people stressed, but like fresh out of sixth form. Um, in 2020, when the six of us got um, employed, we were, we ranged from 18 years old to 24, 23. Um, so yeah, I'm the second oldest. Um, before Lee Day, what was I doing? Um, I, w I actually went to university to study LLB law and I left um, in the middle of year two due to personal reasons. So I feel like I can give you a, a bit of a unique perspective on the pros and cons of the apprenticeship versus the traditional route of going to university. Um, yeah, but before that, I just wanted to talk about um, why I wanted to do law. So um, it's a combination of many random uh, parts that I guess um, create me, but um, it, it, it stems to, down to the music that I listen to. Like um, I listen to a lot of music from human, human rights activists like, like Fela and just being a, a black woman um, and just being here in London, just looking at life you see uh, injustice you see uh, things that aren't fair you and there's something in me that wants to stand up and say no this isn't right and speak out and I feel like that uh, that disposition is what I found in Lee Day when I, this time last year when I was at an open day um, so yeah I knew I wanted to be a lawyer from the age of, of 14 uh, yeah about 13 14 and so from then I was trying to get into get my foot in the door in um, barristers chambers and solicitors firms and magistrates courts trying to get my work experience up um, and luckily the apprenticeship route is a much without I'm not going to say it's easier because the work that's required of you is um, equally as rigorous but it's um, a lot safer I feel like if you went to university what, me going to university I was like okay I've got to do my LLB which will take three years and then after that, I have to find the funds to do an LPC, which is now being phased out and they're doing the SQE. Um, and then after that, I've got to get a training contract and then hope, hopefully after the training contract, get retained and become a qualified solicitor. And there's a lot of, of gaps in there. And, and I've got a lot of friends who have ex who exhausted that route and they've stumbled along the way or, um, they have done the LLB, but they have to take up work in a job they don't want to do because they need to save for the LPC or they haven't got on a training contract yet. You know, there's a lot of, it's a gamble. And I feel like with the apprenticeship, it's equally as competitive to get an apprenticeship. And it's just as hard, 
But once you have secured an apprenticeship, a, a solicitor apprenticeship, you've got the package deal. You've got a five and a half year course that covers the LLB. It covers the SQE and it covers the sort of trainee contract phase. Um, and basically just it's a package deal of everything you need to become a newly qualified solicitor. So that's the big, like the main thing um, that I wanted to point out. Um, I'll talk about the nature of Lee Day. So um, obviously you can read on, the, you can do your own research and you'll, you'll um, learn about the nature of Lee Day in the sense that they believe in access to justice for all. Um, and they are uh, continuing the fight for a fairer society. And they like, to, they um, do work that claimant led work that um, mainly um, defends the injured and the disenfranchised and the marginalized. But what I can tell you, like as a personal um, experience from Lee Day is the number one thing I would say is the culture is very open and friendly. So uh, pre lockdown, you know, you could go out for every Friday night, we'd go out for Friday night drinks, uh, go out for lunches, like it's very casual, it's very, um, okay, you're a new person, let's go out for lunch, like that is really friendly and, and it's not hard to fit in at all. Um, obviously these things are now being replaced with virtual events. So sometimes we have virtual FNDs, um, Friday night drinks, sorry. And, um, you know, you, if you need to catch up with someone, you can do that virtually on Zoom or Teams or whatever. Um, the second thing I would say about Lee Day is, again, I, I guess it's the same thing, but the people are very approachable. So, um, you know, you've got, you've been given instructions from your supervisor, but she's busy at the moment or he's busy at the moment. There are plenty of friendly secretaries and paralegals and, and just loads of colleagues around you that want you to ask for help. And I found that pre Lee Day in certain like law firms, I, if I didn't understand something, I'd be too scared to like say, oh, what, what am I supposed to do? But that doesn't really exist here. Um, another thing that stands out to me about the nature of Lee Day is the commitment that they uh, that they give to the apprentices and our, our success. They are very committed to this five and a half year program in terms of support and resources. Um, I, yeah, I, that is something that I think that's the biggest thing um, in the sense of if we're struggling with something, they will get uh, somebody working in the firm, um, maybe even a partner who's a specialist in the field to give us talks about it. Um, they'll purchase textbooks if we need them um, and they're just very very supportive and they're encouraging for us to to um, come to them with our academic side of our apprenticeship as well as our practical side um, and then the last thing I will say is it's quite calm um, like it's it's not too rigid here in the sense that you know we're not in sharp suits and everything like that like we're in smart casual <laughs> smart casual office wear and um, yeah, it's just not, um, it's not very rigid or, or scary or intimidating at all. It's calm vibes. Um, so the main part of my talk will be um, the apprenticeship versus the traditional route. Um, if any of you are thinking, why should I do the apprenticeship over uh, going to university? So I did talk about the, the route, the journey um, for each one and how the apprenticeship is sort of a package deal that puts everything together. Um, and you don't have to worry about going to the next stage. Um, so I will talk about the pace. Um, so the academic, academically, the pace of university, when I did go, uh, I was studying three or four modules simultaneously, and they were assessed at the same time as well, um, which is good if that's your learning style, then perfect. With um, the apprenticeship at the University of Law, as Alika said, you take on one module at a time, um, and you study it in, in detail for roughly 12 weeks and then after that you do the exam or the coursework or the assessment so it's like one and done you do the coursework you, you sorry you do the, the module you finish it you move on to the next one and I just feel like um, a benefit of that is um, it's much more comprehensive it's much more thorough it's much more extensive um, so yeah if you really and these this isn't like GCSEs or A levels where you overload yourself with the information, you spit it out on the exam and then you throw it away, you don't think about it again. Like these modules are the foundational modules of your LLB and they will be picked up on again later in the SQE, which is the qualification after the LLB. So it's good to, to know these, to get to gain a sort of mastery of these um, topics. Um, 
and so yeah I feel like the apprenticeship there's a lot more discipline involved and you but you produce a lot more um what else the cost so um yeah the cost of the LLB um I think it's like nine nine and a half thousand now but back in my day it was nine thousand a year for tuition not to mention maintenance grants or whatever you need from student finance and then so that's after the LLB you've spent over 27k and then um the sqe is i think it's around roughly four grand um and then obviously during that time you're living the student lifestyle which i mean for some is glamorous and for others is not <laughs> um depending on what you get from student finance i don't know um whereas with the apprenticeship um obviously apprenticeships are government funded um but the firm covers the cost of qualification so they cover the cost of the llb and the sqe with the university of law uh, on top of that you get a salary um which you don't get in university and you you finish the the program debt free which i don't know if that's important to you now but future you will definitely thank you <laughs> well, thank you when there's no deductions being made from your salary um yeah uh, i think the next point is about how much attention you're given. So obviously I don't have the information for all the universities, but in my university, which was uh, Nottingham, I was one of 50,000. Um, and I know other people have had uh, a very um, different experience to mine, but I, I found myself uh, struggling to get a response from my personal tutor. I don't know how many people he was tutoring personally, <laughs> but um, yeah, I it's very easy sometimes because you're one person in tens of thousands of people to be seen as a registration number and not really to be seen as a human. And I feel like with this apprenticeship in the firm, you're one of nine in the university, in your year group, you're one of 100 in your team, you're one of one. <laughs> so it, the benefit is you, you definitely get more attention. Um, you definitely, I do feel like uh, the support is tenfold. Um, then, I know Alika touched on skills. I'll just quickly get through what I want to say. So I feel like with the university, you, there is no, there are opportunities for you to do extracurricular stuff like pro bono, um, mooting, helping out at the local prison, uh, whatever the university um, offers. But if you, if you don't, there's no, um, there's no demand for you to do that. If you just want to focus on your LLB and just get mastery of your LLB and just be a hugely like a really good student, that's fine. You could sail through your three years just learning that. But what I've heard is that um, people, well, some students leave university hugely developed in their knowledge of law, but are hugely underdeveloped in the skills that you would need to get your foot in the door in the workplace. So uh, employability skills like teamwork and communication and organization and problem solving practical skills technical skills these are things that you i'm i've only been here seven and a half months and i'm i'm using all of that you know what i mean like you you end up you, you use you start using it in your induction um and you're going to be doing that for five and a half years you will have honed them and and, and made them as perfect as they need to be um the, i guess the next point would be resources um in the two years that i was in uni i spent about 200 to 300 pounds at the beginning of the year on on expensive law textbooks and the annoying thing about them is they go down in value as soon as you buy them because <laughs> um if you buy one and it's the seventh edition next year they're going to be on the eighth edition and no new law student is going to want your seventh edition they want the latest the latest textbook with all the latest information so they can get the best marks in their exam so reselling them was not very uh pleasurable either but um yeah, um, I feel like you've got loads more resources uh, with the apprenticeship in the sense of you've got your supervisor, you've got various partners who are specialists in what you might be studying, um, who are able to give you talks. You've got, uh, as I mentioned before, we were all a bit like, oh, judicial review is a bit of a sticky one. And um, Frank kindly said, well, let's find a textbook that, you know, can make it more accessible. Um, so, yeah, you're, you're spoiled for resources and you'll have us as well. Um, you'll have six apprentices a year ahead of you who, you know, it's the information and all of that, any techniques that they've used that got them the best grades are fresh in their mind. And, you know, the, as I said, the culture is really friendly. So, yeah, you have us as a resource as well. 
Um, and then I guess the last point in, in comparing the apprenticeship to the traditional route is the lifestyle. So, and this is the one thing I, I will say you won't get <laughs> if you do the apprenticeship. So uh, it depends on how important it is to you, but if you go to university, you will have that student lifestyle where you'll be going out during the weeknight, on weeknights and, you know, it's, it's, it's a weird stage. Everyone's doing something different. Some people are saving for mortgages. Some people are partying all the time. Like <laughs> It's weird, but um, I guess with the apprenticeship, it's a nine to five. You are uh, expected to, to work 9.30 to 5.30. I'm not saying that, you can't go out on the week, right? Um, but you will have to be in at 9.30 the next morning. Um, and I think if you are the type of person that needs or likes structure, then this is perfect for you. Um, yeah, so I guess that's my comparison done. Um, in terms of my experience in the day, um, I think Alika covered the academic side quite well. We call them the weekly essays that we have every, that will, for us, they're due every, every Tuesday morning, are called SUTs. They usually take the shape, the shape of an essay. Um, and we have summer schools, uh, maybe like four or five a year. Um, and we are enrolled at the University of Law, Moorgate, but we have access to both Moorgate and Bloomsbury. Um, which is an incredible campus, loads of resources, late hours, you'll be given a programme lead, you'll be given a personal tutor, um, you'll just be given a lot of um, support and safeguards uh, for your success. The practical side of things, so what do I do when I come into the firm? Um, it started off, so it, I think it's very personalised, I think it's based on your relationship with your supervisor. Um, and you know, you're not given what, they're not overloaded with anything, you're not given what you're not comfortable with. I think I've started off with general office admin duties and, and admin is always going to be a part of, of, the, of, the, um, of the role. Um, and then obviously I work in clinical negligence, so I ended up uh, working with medical records and, and hospitals and doctors and, and um, conducting legal research and working with experts. Uh, if there's a meeting that's happened, it would probably, probably be your role to transcribe that meeting and uh, deal with legal documents and court documents. Um, working in lockdown, actually, I think I'll go through the application process um, because I, I can just envision it being a question at the end. Um, the application process, I guess my advice would be um, authenticity is key. Um, so stop like don't don't think oh i need to be this cookie cut cutter version of myself i think the firm are very interested in who you are and um yeah as i said authenticity is key so even even though you're in lockdown as alika said dress if when it comes to the interview dress smart if you if you know your wi-fi is a bit chop and change get an ethernet cable move closer to the router you know do what you need to do to make sure the experience because i think you're uh privileged in the sense that if you get to the interview stage, you um, you have more control of, of what's going to happen. You can control your lighting, you can control everything um, and just present your best self. Um, I guess with the uh, essay, with the a thousand words that you have to write, um, I, I'm gonna keep saying authenticity, but one thing that really helped me um, if you if you're like an overthinker one thing that really helped me is i got a big a3 paper and i just did a brainstorm i just did a mind map of me and i put my name in the middle of the page and then i just put down events everything that shapes me down to like the music i listen to and it really helped um so uh i don't know if i'm oversharing but i guess um me doing karate that um and my commitment to martial arts that taught me attention to detail and that taught me dedication and these are all transferable skills that can go into your application um yeah i think i'm i think i'm done <laughs> thank you very much uh, josephine that was um, a, a really powerful presentation much like the leakers and as i said i think you two are certainly the the stars of the show uh, uh, uh at tonight's event um, now, having said that, Dave, I'm, I, I don't mean to be unfair because, of course, we're very lucky to have Dave with us. Uh, uh, Dave, I'll, I'll hand over to you. 
Okay, thank you, Jean, and thank you, uh, Josephine and Alika, for that wonderful presentation. I'd like to just make two observations based on uh, those presentations. And the first observation from Josephine's presentation, um, you made me think, Josephine, when you mentioned the purchase of books at university and how the edition is almost immediately outdated as soon as it's bought because the next semester or the next term or the next year, academic year, there's a new edition out. And I try to think about Lee Day as a firm, as a textbook. And it felt to me like Lee Day would not come in as a numbered edition, but as it would just be called the current edition. I'm saying this to all you out there because I'm explaining the nature of the firm is that it's constantly updating itself. So it's always the current edition. So if you want to avoid having an old edition by going to law school, and you want to have the newest edition all the time, then Libby as a firm represents the current edition. As a matter of fact, I might, do it, I might be doing it a disservice because Libby often reaches into the future to try and shape the law. And that it's not, it's not, this is not the first time it has happened in cases where Lede is ahead of the law. And you, you're not to presume that the state of the law, as we know it, is all right. It needs help. It needs pushing along. And so that's the point I'd make from Josephine's point there that I observed. And the point I'll make from Alika's presentation it's how powerful it was, Alika, when you were talking about, you might not appreciate it now, but you'll certainly appreciate coming to the end of your qualification and not having a debt. And this is really summing up what the apprenticeship program is all about, is learning whilst you're earning. And I can think of nowhere else where you... I can get an education, a qualification, and indeed a profession, and be paid for it. This is a unique and a golden opportunity for you all out there. And I know it's hard if you're competing for a role to still share it. But I'm going to ask you to perhaps to do one of the hardest things. And it's to act seemingly against your, in your best interest, but it really isn't. It's only seemingly against your best interest and share this opportunity far and wide. There are about 40 of us registered on the program right now, live. And I think more people need to hear about this program. And we are sharing it far and wide. We are glad you've joined us today. But we think if you know anybody who this might benefit you should continue to share it. And if for any reason at all, you're doubting yourself or you're doubting whether you should apply, you should remove that doubt straight away and just apply. There might be one or two, there might be just one exception to this. And I saw, I've been checking in on the questions and it seemed like a question came through somebody uh, already had a degree, and I think that the application for apprentices is open to people who have not had a degree as yet. So that might be unfortunately the only scenario. But there's no other scenario where you should rule yourself out of applying for this program and for sharing it widely. So now to my presentation, which I'll keep very brief. About, around about five years ago, I sat in the most comfortable chair of my life, and this was in the Supreme Court. And sitting alongside me was about maybe five other lawyers, um, one of whom was Sandy Okoro. Sandy Okoro is now... 
uh, legal counsel within the World Bank headquartered in Washington, D.C. Sandy Okora, originally coming from um, Britain, and her background goes to work in the HSBC at the highest level in the legal department, and prior to that, Bearings Bank, highest level of the, uh, of the law, uh, in-house. Also on that panel was Courtney Griffiths. Some of you may have heard of Courtney Griffiths. Courtney Griffiths is regarded as one of the greatest, um, the most accomplished uh, criminal barristers in this country. All of us, black, the common thing we share on this pan, the common thing we share, all of us sitting in these comfortable chairs, all of us are from the black community. But none of us were justices of the Supreme Court, the highest court in the land. We were there for an event put on by an organization called Inspirational You. And this organization is led by Sonia Meggy. Some of you may have heard about her, but you might have heard of the organization Inspirational You. And the, the event was put on to encourage uh, people into the law, um, particularly from the black community, to, uh, 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 to, to, to you know, join the legal profession. So this was some five plus years ago. Um, and it is not to say any of us could not be seen as aspiring to become judges sitting on the bench. But currently, in the history of the Supreme Court of England, of the, of the UK, the, uh, of England and Wales, there's, 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 uh, there's never, we've never had a black person sitting as a, a justice in that, in that court. We were simply sitting in their seats that day. And uh, come to about a year ago now, to close the loop on my story, Libby, our firm, took a case to the Supreme Court. And uh, that case was argued. Uh, all the barristers were white males, if I can remember. I went to, visit, I went to the court. Uh, there were no black barristers arguing the case. Front bench, all white. But the case was a case involving exclusively black people in Africa uh, working in copper mines. This is the Vedanta case. It was a heartbreaking moment for me to see that the law has not developed in a way where we've seen the progress of, uh, although we have. Uh, almost an overrepresentation of, um, of the black community studying law, getting into university, even entering the profession. We don't have the progression that we'd expect to see by now. And I think this is not good enough for the legal community. We cannot say we are upholding. We cannot even say we have a good legal system without proper representation from the various communities represented across the UK. Lide recognizes this as a firm and wants to do something about it, wants to balance it because we have a better legal system when we have proportionate representation from the different sectors of communities. And where it comes to, when it comes to uh, uh, men, from the black community, and I won't even say young because this opportunity is open to uh, black men uh, of any age really, um, we're short. And that's not good for the law. When I went to law school in America, I started law school in America and my eyes were opened. I mean, in America, there's a different system of teaching the law, which is called the Socratic method, which requires you to do a lot of reading and then going to lectures and not being lectured to, but asked questions by your professor. And it, it wasn't until I started to read the cases of Thurgood Marshall, the first black justice 
of the Supreme Court of America, did I start to see a kind of cultural relevance in some of the judgments in these cases. And it appealed to me so much. So I believe that representation of all cultures within the law, within the law is very important. I uh, then set out to read his autobiography, his biography, and later learned that Thurgood would often ask his clerks, how will this judgment affect black people? How will this judgment affect the marginalized in society? And I'm afraid that I have no confidence that at the highest levels of our justice system, or even of our, of our legislative system, there are people asking this question. How will this affect the black community? How will this affect the marginalized? Certainly, that question was not asked when this algorithm was put together for this recent A-level and O-level debacle. People weren't asking that. They were not interested. And if they were asking that question, they probably weren't even interested in the answer and whether people were adversely affected. I really don't think you can have a proper system of law operating in any nation with elements of that nation excluded at the lowest and highest levels of that system. And this is why it's important that you're with us today. And this is why, I mean, I should call this presentation, Why You? This is why, why you? And this is not just a boat color of your skin. But it comes with a cultural context as well. And I would say, for the people selected to be highly effective and make a difference to the legal community within London and the UK, it's about your culture as well. It's about your cultural capital and what you bring by virtue of your culture. Not just for the externalities, but what you bring. The nuances, the thoughts, the background, the experiences. So, if you're traveling to a foreign country and you're on your way to the airport, you should not leave your passport behind. And if you are fortunate enough to be selected for this position, you should not leave your cultural capital behind because therein lies your power and your efficiency and your effectiveness. Thank you very much. Dave, thank you very much for that uh, a powerful uh, uh, view on uh, the importance of this apprenticeship scheme and actually touch on a number of wider issues um, that uh, frankly need to be raised. Um, I'm very grateful for that, Dave. And um, Fran, if I can hand over to you um, for, for your presentation, that'd be uh, great. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jean. And thank you to uh, Lika and Joe and to Dave for all the thoughts and um, views that they've brought to date. I'm going to uh, cover just a few of the things which are more practical about coming to the course um, and why Lead A, what sort of things Lead A is doing to ensure that all our students can um, study. And as uh, Dave raised, um, earning and learning at the same time, but I think the third, um, learning on the job, uh, as, as Alika and Joe have mentioned in their particular teams, and learning at university. So earning, learning and studying all together. I think it is quite an ask, as, um, and I think Joe is right to say that you need to be quite structured in order to get through it. But I don't think that's something that you have to necessarily have off pat immediately. It's something that can be learned. I can see them both nodding and I think that's right. It's something that can be learned and it's one of the things at Lead A that we hope to set up in the first month when you arrive, guiding you into how you can learn and study and um, get recompense for that, get paid for that at the same time. Um, 
what, what you find is that the modules that you get asked to undertake over the period of time that you're uh, at Lee Day are exactly the same as the ones you'd be doing at uni if you were outside. And you're doing them at the same time that you're going through different areas of work in the firm. So the structure that you learn in the first few months about how to balance your time between working on the job, working at uni, having input from the, like the team that Jean and Dave and I make up, it's all part of being on the job. Um, at the same time, you're learning different modules, two or three each year to take you through to the end of 15 modules in all, just as you would if you were at uni outside. And Joe has been through the, um, the benefits and ups and downs of whether to go to university or not. I wanted to say a little bit about how to enter into an apprenticeship, the apprenticeship at Lee Day. Dave's mentioned the um, disastrous algorithm that the government put in place with their A-level outcomes last week. And we think it's quite likely that some of the grades are going to be slightly different to what you might have expected, um, depending on how your teacher has viewed you. Um, generally, you have to get three decent A-level grades in order to get onto an apprenticeship. Um, what we're just suggesting is we've spoken in the past to the University of Law where grades haven't necessarily been exactly what's required. Because if we really believe in the person, when we do our interviews, then we're prepared to go to the University of Law and argue for a particular grade, even if it hasn't quite hit the mark. So if you feel when you're looking through the criteria that's sent round by our human resources team that it's not quite you, have another think about it because if you're really passionate about coming in and doing the job, we may be able to argue specially for you if you've got other qualities which we can see. Uh, one of the main of which is, have you got the sticking power to stay at Lee Day and do this course for six years or almost six years? Because if we can see that in you and the passion for doing the work, we'll certainly argue for you at lower grades than you would otherwise have to get. Um, you do need to prepare for an interview. Um, Jean was one that was our chair last year when we were interviewing. Uh, I think it was clear those people who'd thought a lot about whether or not to become a solicitor apprentice and they brought with them histories and stories of how they've been interested in the law for some time. Um, some of them brought immigration cases they might have been involved in themselves or things that had affected their families at different times which had sparked off something, some thought patterns, some learning, some reading, even novels and poetry, anything that you can show that really shows that you're going to get stuck into the law when you come. So those things are quite important. Um, the modules that you study, like tort law, like law of litigation or contract, they won't always be things that interest you and neither would they always be modules that are work which is reflected within our firm. But what we try to do, and there is a program throughout this whole five and a half to six year period, is to move each apprentice around so that they end up studying in six different places, six different areas of law in our firm. Um, whether that's in clinical negligence or human rights law or law relating to um, litigation like road traffic accidents or indeed as you get more senior we're going to move some people into the international law teams who might be able to travel uh, abroad with some of our solicitors who work on uh, the sorts of case that Dave was referring to, the Vedanta case that got as far as the Supreme Court. So there are lots of opportunities for you to learn on the job and learn all sorts of different things as you're going through at the same time as picking up the legal knowledge in the university. Um, I think those are the main things really. The difference for me is, as has been remarked on by others, you are paid by us at a reasonable rate to come and work and study and learn and um, that is very different to going through university and getting the university experience at, at quite a, an expense these days. 
So I'm happy to answer questions in the Q&A about, about the way it works, but that's just a little bit of an introduction to the sort of thing we'd be looking for in an apprentice, a keenness in the law, even if you haven't actually studied it, uh, showing why it is that you'd want to come and work as a legal apprentice and take on something which is going to be quite a chunk out of your life, but couldn't be better, really, if you're passionate about um, following it through. Thank you. Many, many thanks, Fran. I think um, there were some important uh, points that you made there in terms of the process. And uh, I think that they, they will feature highly in the questions that are starting to come through. We've had, we have had quite a few questions, so we'll do our best as a panel to try to answer those. Um, I wonder if, if just picking up on uh, the point of uh, uh, pr procedural type questions, whether we might just um, deal with some of the early, easier questions, if you see what I mean. Um, I see one that's been directed at us in relation to uh, uh, is there an age limit uh, to applying? Um, I think Dave may have addressed that previously. And in fact, uh, uh, there is no age limit. I think what is important is that we are looking for individuals who are yet to complete their undergraduate studies and um, frankly have a commitment to uh, become a solicitor apprentice and to see through the five to six years. So uh, a restriction, if you like, is anybody who already has a degree, they wouldn't be suitable to apply. But of course, you may well be in the middle of your degree and decide that in fact, this is the way that you'd like to, 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 to go in and, and you'd like to become a qualified solicitor through this route. So that is entirely open to you. Um, but I'm afraid anybody who's already obtained their undergraduate qualifications, this is not a route that would be open to them. But of course, there are other routes that are open to you as a, as a graduate. Um, you, the, the traditional training contract route would be potentially open to you, um, provided that you have completed the legal practice course, as it is now, um, then, then you, could, you could apply to Lee Day or other firms um, uh, in that way. So it isn't that the door is closed entirely, it's just, just in relation to this particular route. I see that we have uh, a question um, in relation to when will the interviews be held and uh, when are you likely to find out if a particular applicant is successful? I don't know if anybody on the panel wanted to answer that. The closing date for applications is the 7th of September. And we'll be spending the rest of that month sorting out who it is that's going to come in for interview. The interview should be at the end of September. And applicants will find out early in October um, who's been successful and who hasn't. That gives plenty of time for applications by Lee Day for those individuals to the University of Law because we have to do that and the University of Law has to admit them before we can actually uh, give the posts. We didn't have any difficulty last year, it's just an administrative process I think I'd say. So early October you'd find out. Many, many thanks Fran. Um, I can see that there's another question that's come in to us in relation to uh, the city in which the apprentice would be based, the solicitor apprentice would be based. Um, again, I think that's, that's, that's an easy one that I can answer. So it's, although we do have an office in Manchester and a smaller office uh, uh, also in Liverpool, that the apprenticeship uh, scheme would actually be based in London. It would be at our London office. Um, I think mm -hmm. that the benefit of that is that we have all of our uh, uh, 2020 apprentices with us here in London. And obviously, we, we can certainly see the benefit in um, the, the 2021's intake being so close to our 2020 intake and, and learning from their experiences. And frankly, having that sort of support that uh, Josephine did a very good job of explaining that would be available to uh, those, those individuals who'd been appointed. I'm just looking over the questions as they come in. <laughs> this is a good one. Uh, 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 how many uh, applicants do you typically expect to receive? Uh, again, I don't know if anybody on the panel wants to address that. Perhaps, perhaps Fran again, I think. 
Uh, yes, well, I can only really speak about the only year that we've done. So um, we had approximately 40 applicants. We appointed six of them. Of those 40, there were three men and um, none of them were appointed. So that's one of the reasons we are particularly looking this time around for um, black males. We, we were unsuccessful in finding anyone applying last time who hit the bar. I'd like to add something to that. I mean, I personally would like to see 100 applicants on this, um, even though we are looking for three apprentices. I, I can't emphasize how strongly I, I would uh, recommend uh, uh, applications from, from the community. And the reason I said this is because the application pool, the initial um, size of the application pool is not just about the people that will be selected. It sends a strong message to the whole legal community about the number of, of applicants that are out there who can make great apprentices. Mm -hmm. Other law firms should be doing this as well. I think Lee Day can raise its voice in the legal community to say that uh, it can take so many and no more, but other law firms should be doing this. And if, I mean, I, uh, technically, I mean, I suppose there'll be a GDPR process around it, but I, I, I can envision a, a, a scenario where great quality applications are coming in and, and we're able to say to the legal community, there are a lot of great minds out there who can be placed in law firms. And if those, and th even those people who are not successful mm -hmm. in 2021, there, I think there needs to be some advocacy around talking about the amount of people out there who would like to pursue law as a career through the apprenticeship scheme and other law firms should be opening up their doors and um, we should really be able to measure this demand and try to push the supply along with the demand as well. And this is why I said earlier that as many of you should have income. Some of you will realize who are listening right now will begin to understand that you are ruled out because some of you have your degrees already or some of you are parents and you realize your child uh, is too young for this year, 2021. But you will know of others who you should share this opportunity with. And I'd strongly encourage you to share this opportunity widely so that we can show the strength of talent that's out there and try to see if we can fill these spaces as much as we can. That will be my contribution. Many, many thanks, Dave. I, I just wanted to pick up on one point that, that Dave mentioned there in his comment, which actually goes to a question that we've received, which is actually um, the reason that this scheme is so important is because we recognize that there is um, a talent uh, in the wider community that isn't being represented in the legal community and it's a method of us trying to uh, improve that position and in terms of the, the the importance of the scheme we saw last year when we got on the way with the 20 well this earlier this year but in 2019 when we started recruitment we saw that it impacted other firms coming out into the legal press, talking about what they wanted to do to try to improve what is recognized as a problem. It's recognized that, that, that there's an underrepresentation of uh, black solicitors. And um, this is a purposeful uh, uh, attempt to try to redress that particular problem. Um, and, you know, as Fran mentioned, we are into our second year now of being able to, to bring people into the firm. I see there's a question about uh, when do we anticipate that there'll be another uh, round of appointments. Well, at this point, we're not saying that there will necessarily be for at Lee Day. We are um, organically growing this scheme and we hope, obviously, to be able to do it 
uh, uh, if, if possible and if the need remains, we would hope to be able to do it. But I would hope that one of the things that comes from this is not just the fact that we're having brilliant solicitor apprentices joining our firm and the next generation of, 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 of top flight lawyers, but actually we're encouraging others, other law firms to take, take the initiative and actually do something to bring about a positive change. Um, so I, I hope that that uh, addresses uh, 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 a couple of questions I've seen that, that go to go to that issue. Um, I wondered uh, if one of our solicitor apprentices would be happy to address this question, which is, what does a typical day look like as an apprentice? Yeah, um, I think we both could because we get put in different departments and they're completely different. Um, so. As you know, I've, I work in clinical negligence. So <clears throat> I guess um, I would start off my day by looking at my emails, um, trying to uh, make a priority list, um, which is ever changing in clinical negligence. Um, and uh, so yeah, to-do lists are like the first thing I do and looking at my emails. Um, it's good practice in my department whenever there's um, external talks, um, medico legal external talks um to go to those and internal talks we're just constantly learning constantly trying to get better at our field and you know law is uh is like a living thing it's constantly being updated so um yeah it's good practice to go to those so if there is <clears throat> a talk or a meeting or a training session then that's what i would do um but it shows up in all of our calendars anyway um now that we we are in i used to have a nice 10 a.m meeting with my team's relatively small it's me my supervisor and a paralegal i used to have a nice 10 a.m meeting with them just to uh, touch base and to look at our cases and stuff now that is taking place over teams and it's not every it's not as often um so yeah what else would happen um as I said, I, I work with medical records, so tasks aren't very uh, short. They're quite, it might take a day or a number of days. Um, so yeah, it's, it's a case of, of sorting through medical records and figuring out, reaching out to experts and figuring out um, how we can best help this person who has suffered an injury or a serious illness or maybe even death from uh, substandard care from a hospital or, or a medical professional. So yeah, that, that's my work. Um, as I said, it starts with, with um, general admin stuff, um, but you, I think one thing in my department, I, I'm sure it applies everywhere, but in my department, attention to detail is so important. So um, you're, you are more impressive if you take your time and really go through it, if you're drafting something or, or doing something for your supervisor. Um, as opposed to thinking, oh, um, I can get this done in 20 minutes because, you know, speed is like speed isn't isn't king. It's actually um, attention to detail and, and and going through through care, going through things carefully and making sure you get them right. So, yeah, that that's what my day consists of. Um, I think as well, just to add on to that, um, I think obviously it depends on which department you'll be placed in, which will obviously depend on what you do. Um, but I think when when they give tasks as well, they will make sure that is is that is actually able is possible. Sorry for you to to complete the task. Um, so for example, I some of the tasks that I get now would match my skill set. They would match my ability, the the complexity that I'm able to manage. And where it's just above that, then obviously there's assistance available for you. Um, and I think it it just like it constantly increases your ability to learn, etc. Um, so, for example, oh gosh, what would I do on a daily basis? Um, it really varies. Obviously, same as Josephine in the sense that you review your task list, like what actually does need to be completed today. Priorities um, definitely need to be reviewed daily. Things change um either very quickly or not so quickly but it's always good for you to be on the ball with that um and then the day generally goes on with just completing the tasks and if anything comes up then you will definitely be having like a conversation with your manager 
um, or your supervisor, sorry. And then, um, yeah, sometimes you'll be working with someone else on the team on a specific aspect of uh, uh, a case. Um, sometimes you'll just be given a task, obviously, that will explain things properly to you. And then you'll go ahead with that. Um, it might, you might be in a client meeting, um, you might be in an internal meeting, taking meeting minutes, um, whether it be verbatim, which is definitely a skill that needs practice, uh, and, and definitely needs to be home. It's hard guys. Uh, but just things like that. Um, and as well, like I'm quite involved in the marketing aspect for me personally, I love all things digital and design and, um, all of that great stuff. So some of my tasks are, revolve, are revolved around marketing, research into that, for example. Um, but say if I was in another department, that might not necessarily apply. Um, so I think if it, it very much depends on which area in the firm you're in, what need does your team um, have uh, and, and how can you meet that? So, yeah, that's it. And I think I think those are both really helpful uh, summaries of, of what it's like. It's always a difficult question, isn't it? What's a typical day like at Lee Day? Because there's always so much variation. Um, it's it's uh, certainly something my my team say to me that 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 obviously we have targets and ideas of what we want to achieve because we're moving our cases forward on a regular basis. But um, litigation, the, the actual nature of it means that you have to be able to adapt to a change in direction at the drop of a hat. And um, what that brings, certainly for me, I, I think it's really an interesting area to be in. Um, I quite like I quite like the cut and thrust of litigation, and um, I think all of our lawyers do enjoy that. Um, a nice legal fight. Uh, <laughs> all right, uh, I'm just looking at uh, some of the other questions that have come in. Um, I can see that there, there's, there is a question about what happens towards the end of your uh, apprenticeship. But I think perhaps before that, there's, there's, there, it might be helpful for, to hear from Fran in relation to um, the stages of an apprenticeship, because I can see that there seems to be some questions relating to um, what is it like uh, as you progress through the, the the process, what's it like in year one, you know, the first and second year, and then as you move towards the uh, uh, qualification uh, exam in, in, in year six. Um, a friend, I, I wondered if you might be able to give a little bit more information about that side of things. Well, if we're looking at the two streams of, of the uni and, and of the work in the firm, uh, and trying to marry up becoming better at both as you know the, the legal study and the work with the different departments as you get more senior. The first four years really is based around ensuring you get your LLB. So getting your degree after four years of study. Um, you have, uh, as I think um, Joe mentioned, you have a day off each week at least 20% of your time every single week that you're in Lee Day is spent at the university whether that's physically which you know barring COVID you can actually go in and use the library and um, look at books read books magazines etc or studying online um, at the same time that you're being taken through tasks gradually over that four-year period so perhaps starting off with some very basic things, some, some apprentices might not have actually worked in offices before, and that doesn't matter at all. But if you haven't, you might not know the structure of working in an office. So you might sit and work with some of the most junior administrative people so that you come to understand how a file works or how you open a file or how you bring a client into the office things that need to be learned before you can really get on to understanding what the law is that you're learning at the university that can be applied to working in the teams. So we've planned it so that as the apprentices get more senior, uh, the tasks that they'll have internally are more complex. And that's up to the supervisor that they're working with, the pace that they work at. Obviously, COVID has been quite a challenge 
um, for the supervisors at Lee Day as it has for the apprentices. I think we've done pretty well um, in terms of making sure everybody stays on board, but perhaps the structure that we would have had if we'd been in the office in with oversight is a bit different to what it would have been otherwise. But generally the idea is to give slightly more complex tasks each, each time you get into something new, just as the law that's being learned becomes a bit more complicated and the questions that the apprentices have to answer for law school gradually are getting more complicated. We found that out, that there are more problems after six months. Initially, it was, it was more read this and write it down again. Now it's read it, think about it and answer a question about it. So that's the first four years, really. And at the end of four years, you get the same degree that anyone would have if they'd gone off to university. So it's an LLB, which you could use for anything else. Um, but the last two years are very much like a training contract in terms of getting our solicitor apprentices to do the qualifying exam, the SQE, which is just being brought in now, so nobody's taken one yet, whatever route you're going down to get to be a solicitor. No one's had an exam as an SQE, but you will be, the apprentices will be taking the exact same exam as are being taken by trainees who come straight out of university into a training contract, or indeed by paralegals who have made their way through their law firm by studying on the job, but not having the opportunity to have a, a law degree paid for by them. So there'll be three different, completely different routes, but the solicitor apprentice route will be um, as valid, uh, the same, same outcome. And at Lee Day, we're intending that everyone who qualifies after the five and a half to six years will have the same opportunity to have a job will qualify into a job just like our trainee solicitors here and anyone else who's come up through the system of, of uh, training on the job. I think that probably covers. But it's heavily structured yes. and the idea is that everybody would know in advance of each year what it is they're going to be doing, uh, basically, basically. Thanks, Jean. That's really, no, many thanks, Fran. That's very helpful. Um, I think I think that is a, a reoccurring theme in some of the questions I've seen. Well, you know, uh, what happens at the end? Well, you know, you will be a qualified solicitor at the end, and you the you know, the, the, we hope we hope that you'd be able to stay at Lee Day. Um, but if that wasn't possible, you're a qualified solicitor, having been at Lee Day, which has quite a good reputation, I would I would say, of course. But uh, it should mean that you would be able to go into the uh, wider a uh, uh, legal market and fi find find another job. I mean, uh, we clearly would like the people who we've invested in over six years to stay with the firm, because that's that's why we want want those people on the on the course. But you know, if people saw external uh, 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 opportunities that they'd like to take up, then then that would be open to them to do so. Um, I'll just looking at the questions that have come in I can see that there's a question here in relation to whether this would be a suitable route for somebody who wanted to become a barrister um, I, I think that the answer to that is, is is no because what we're looking at here is that having completed the um, uh, apprenticeship the individual would be a qualified solicitor and um, would be entering that side of the profession rather than the barristerial side. I mean, in, in more detail, of course, it is quite possible for solicitors to uh, requalify as barristers as well, but um, I don't think that's the question that's been raised with me. Um, I think it's a more direct question as to whether this is directly applicable to somebody who wants to be a barrister. And I, I can say the answer to that is no. Well, uh, I wonder. I wonder if Dave might uh, address this question because uh, they, 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 Dave, Dave, um, uh, how would you describe your time at Lee Day? Now, I, 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 I direct that question towards Dave because Dave actually, well, uh, back when he was being a, a pure lawyer, actually worked at Lee Day, but now, of course, he's back with us in a consultant role. 
But I wondered if you might have a few comments, Dave, that would be, uh, I'm sure, of interest to, the, to, 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 to those on, uh, listening to the webinar. Um, yeah, thanks for directing that question to me, Jean. Um, I'll say just... <laughs> Lida is quite frankly the best place I've ever worked in my entire career. I've worked many places in my career. That is not to say it is a perfect firm because no firm is perfect. But I would describe Lida as a learning organization, an organization that's prepared to look at itself, learn about itself, and make adjustments to become its better self. This is why it is doing this right now. And this is why um, Lide, for example, has a department called the regulatory department uh, that Alika sits in and can tell you more about that. The reason why she's doing the work she's doing is because of the experience Lide has been through uh, with the regulators itself and decided not to waste a jot of that experience or turn it into just a miserable experience, but to turn it around to help other solicitors who are going through what Lide has been through. That is a reflective, nimble learning organization. I say Lide is the best law firm, R really. I, I mean, I've traveled the world, guys. I'm not trying to overemphasize this thing or over-exaggerate it. And I'm external now, so I can really speak my mind. But it's a phenomenal law firm. One that's competent in the law, uh, but also pushing the law, looking at itself, reframing and reshaping itself, remaining relevant to its time, speaking to the issues of the day, using the law as a tool to socially engineer, going beyond the call of duty of lawyers as just taking on cases to make money, but to shape the society, change the law, provide a range of uh, resources online from podcasts. Right now, these apprentices are working on podcasts that are uh, raising awareness and uh, around um, uh, all sorts of issues, including the Windrush scandal and so on, to help people along, taking on cases that are not necessarily money earners, but are just helping people along, going into schools, church, and uh, faith-based organization, giving free legal advice and so on. There's no better place to work, in my view. It's a phenomenal firm. It is not a perfect firm, but it's a phenomenal firm. And its perfection or its journey towards perfection is bounded up with this here seminar webinar of trying to recruit more people from the society and the community that reflect its component parts. And that is why it's driven towards a path of constantly improving itself. That would be my uh, view. And that's me being very measured about it. I'm trying not to be too excited in my response. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Jean. So uh, I wondered if uh, we might address a question that has come up uh, that relates to whether an individual is able to apply for uh, this particular role if they're not uh, based in the UK. Um, Fran, I wondered if you had any thoughts on, on that point. You, uh, well, from an employment perspective, they have to have um, the right paperwork to allow them to work here. Uh, it, the question isn't 100% clear to me by not based. Do they mean currently living in wherever, but able to come and live and work here at any time? or living somewhere else altogether, which would not give them the right to work, because that would be a different matter and we, we wouldn't be able to, um, I don't know about accept an application, but we wouldn't be able to appoint them if they didn't have the right to work um, and reside here. So I, I don't know if the question's quite sim been put in a simple way. I, I think it's ambiguous in terms of the actual immigration side of things 
nothing to prevent someone relocating here if they've got the right to uh, live and work here. But we couldn't appoint somebody who didn't have those legal rights. Thank you, thank you, friend. That's um, that's 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 very helpful, and I think very clear. Um, I wonder if I might direct uh, some questions first towards uh, our solicitor of apprentices, and then perhaps Fran and Dave and myself can chip in. And that is really go into uh, hints and tips for uh, 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 making a successful application. I think we've had some of those in the responses we've we've had already from the panel, but I wondered if 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 if, if we might be able to offer a few more. I think one of the first things I would say is when it comes to the actual application process um, is to, obviously Josephine has mentioned it quite clearly, to be honest. Um, obviously you should definitely have that authenticity. Um, but I think just basic things, please check your spelling, grammar and punctuation. Uh, people generally think, you know, I'm just typing up really quickly. Please check it over. Um, still important. Um, I would also say to include as well, I mean, obviously this is not mandatory, um, but if you're obviously aiming for authenticity, then, you know, adding something that relates to you specifically. Um, so, for example, in my application, I was just blown away by this book that I was reading. Um, oh, gosh, I can't even remember what it's called. I think it was called uh, What It Means, Who Really Runs Britain or something like that. Uh, or maybe another book. Anyway, um, it was it was including this like really interesting immigration case and I was like this is just too good not to include um and then also you know feel free to include if you have been to master classes or if you do have legal experience um then put it in there if you don't have legal experience then I think it's still worth mentioning um the fact that you worked elsewhere um, the fact that, you know, you're actually able to turn up on time to work and maintain that for some period. If you've worked in an office environment, that's great because these are skills that are transferable. Um, so, yeah, definitely in the application process, I think it's a good point to include transferable skills, even if you're straight out of A-levels. You know, there's, there's definitely ways to, to include the fact that you are a suitable candidate for this position. I would also say when it comes to being, to going into the interview, I was most, I was nervous. <laughs> uh, probably <laughs> you guys weren't able to tell whilst I was in the interview room, but I was super nervous. And I think um, one of the things that definitely helped me was to recognize that I could actually get this position and like, it could really be me here six years later or five and a half years later as a qualified solicitor. So I think that's super important. Um, and also, uh, I think it's important to not necessarily highlight, but, you know, show your work ethic because this course is not, it's not a walk in the park. Um, the support is definitely there, but in the same breath, you need to put in work. Like this is not just going to be handed to you um, and I think just being able to use and show real life examples to highlight what makes you like an unquestionable candidate for this position um, is something that I think you should you should definitely include. Um, so yeah, that's it. That's what I would say. Josephine. Um, yeah, uh, thank you, Carl. I think. Um, Back to my, um, can you hear me okay? It says my internet connection isn't stable. Yes, please, go ahead. Um, yeah, so back to my point about brainstorming yourself and just getting it all down on paper. Um, yes, transferable skills. So obviously be original. Um, an example from my application Josephine, I think I think your connection may have let you down there. Um, I've had the same thing happen to me tonight, so I, I, I'm with you. Uh, can you hear us now, Josephine? Dave, would you like to step in with a, 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 a hint, 
uh, a tip that might assist uh, would-be applicants? Okay. Um, yes, I think that in general, um, any sort of law program uh, or any program indeed would look highly upon something like a debating society, let's say, or let's say something that we all know about or should know about, the Duke of Edinburgh, uh, Duke of Edinburgh Awards, yeah? It speaks for itself, the Duke of Edinburgh Awards, right? And if you've done that, employers and universities and uh, will, 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 will view that, will, will treat that as highly favorable. Now, if this is not your background, you need to recognize that there's a parallel experience you have that is the same thing. You have to begin to start to ask yourself, what was my equivalent experience that made me who I am today? It might not have a name, but if you were looking after somebody, if you were caring for a member of family, if you had to do some work in the community, if you had to wake up early and do chores before going to school, if you are doing all these extra things, there is unfortunately no name for this. Whereas it, that can be captured as easily as the Duke of Edinburgh scheme or lacrosse team, or I was uh, doing like a horse riding club or my, or my debating society. But if you're involved in faith-based organization, helping out, food for the poor, all of these organizations, doing all these things, you have to capture it, panel it, and encapsulate it in something that's presented so forcefully and powerfully that leaves us in no doubt that what you've done there is equally powerful, if not more powerful, than the aforementioned uh, clubs, organizations, and societies that I mentioned. Do not be afraid to take the elements of your life and frame it uh, into a, 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 that something that makes you highly attractive. I am, I am highly impressed with students that have more than their uh, academic school work to do, but they have other responsibilities with regards to the family, with regards to the community. That is highly impressive. But most, a lot of students don't think they can make that impression. It is impressive to us. So think about your lives, who you are. I think Alika and Josephine has been excellent in explaining this, about this whole business of this authentic self, how you came to be the person you are today, how you came to get that grade that you got today. Suppose it wasn't an A. It's an A. Question every organization should be asking itself. What is the, 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 the anatomy and physiology of a good grade? Should that grade be examined in light of how much time that person had and afforded, given their privilege, or should it be measured against all the other competing and contrasting and difficulty students have to face? And I think firms have to start to do that now. So do not be afraid to articulate all the challenges that came with becoming who you are today. That's what I'd say. And I'd like to... Uh, many, many, many thanks for that like to just add to that that certainly there's room on your application form for setting out some of the things you might have done which are not along the debating route we we particularly make space for you to set out if there have been family circumstances or life circumstances that might be a bit different that's what it's there for and if you do get called for an interview the interview panel um, as last time, are very interested to hear about everything that actually goes to make up you. So it's not like a UCAS application form at all. It's really getting to understand and know the things that are, are you, as, as Joe was explaining before. But I totally reiterate, Dave, if you've had years of caring for parents or, or other family members and been studying as well, it definitely is the sort of thing that we want to hear about, see written down, and then discuss with you when you come in front of the interview panel. 
Can I just add on to that? Um, just one point. Um, basically, I just wanted to just reiterate that um, it's not only oh, what what about me is related to law and what can I put into this um, application that you know is is legal. Um, when we say authenticity, when we say be yourself, we want to know about everything. If you are, if you want to learn a new language or you know a different language, if you're interested in like Alika is interested in um, design and editing and, and that sort of stuff. Like it, it's, it, not only do we get a better feel for who you are, but it, your talents could be used in the firm elsewhere. You, like this is not just, uh, okay, we're taking you on for five years and it's like law, law, law. Like you, this is gonna be a huge part of your life. It's more than half a decade. So it's, it's you know, when you uh, let people know who you are, then they then the firm can figure out how to enrich the parts to yeah just to provide enrichment and how to foster and accommodate for everything that you have to offer and everything that you want to pursue as well so i just wanted to because it, there might be creatives out there who think oh i have to restrict that um and just keep it law and legal and it's like no we want the whole the whole thing we want the full the full picture but yeah that that's my only point <laughs> I think it's a very, very good point. Thank you very much, Josephine. Um, I noticed that we have slightly gone over our time already. It's always the nature of these things once, once the questions start to come in. Um, I, I hope we've managed to address uh, uh, most of the questions. I, can, I don't think we've managed to address them all, but of course, please do uh, contact us if there's any questions about the apprenticeship scheme, and we'll be very happy to try to address those questions and come back with answers. I think that, that probably the, the important thing to take away it, it is that uh, we want you to apply. Um, we are looking for the best candidates, and uh, I'm sure that some of the people listening to us today will be joining us in January. Um, the, the, the process is, is on the way. I think the applications will start uh, to hopefully come through to us in September. And uh, after that, we will be considering those and inviting people in for interviews. Uh, I say inviting in, but it may be a virtual interview subject to what's going on in the wider world. Um, I wanted to just take the opportunity to thank the panel for their time uh, this evening. It's been an enlightening uh, conversation and I hope that we've been able to provide answers to most of the questions that have been put to us. And as I say, do, do get in contact if you'd like some more information. Um, and, and thank you again for uh, attending this evening. <laughs>